<clears throat> I'm going to um, do my best to give you the route that uh, talk about the different places that on Paul's journey to Rome and um, where this begins <clears throat> of course we're going to we're beginning it at Jerusalem because that's where he's at that's where he he gets arrested if you remember at the end of Paul's third missionary journey he actually comes down uh, to Caesarea which is right here he comes down to Caesarea and um, this is where um, some of his pals live uh, Philip the evangelist is there with his daughters and uh, and tells him not to go okay what's interesting is he winds up back in Caesarea for about two years and um, for two years, he, he, Philip the Evangelist, walked in there every day to say hi to Paul and say, I told you so. Anyway, um, that would have been kind of embarrassing. Anyway, let's, uh, we'll get into this a little bit. There are like, this is from Acts 21.15 to Acts 28.16. This is the time that he's at Jerusalem. Remember, he's, he's going down there because he thinks he can convert the Jews, or at least he's, gonna, he's willing to die trying, according to his words, you know. He's willing to give his life um, to try to convert Israel. And uh, so he goes down there. He takes a vow. Uh, he participates in the things of the temple. And everything's going great. He's nearly the last day uh, of that vow when some Jews from Ephesus, and they all come down for this stuff, man. They all come back to Jerusalem for this. I'm not sure exactly what the time frame would have been. Could have been a feast. But they all come back down for that, and they spotted him. And that's when they started screaming that this is the man that teaches against Moses, against the law, blah, blah, blah. Oh, he brought a Greek in the temple. None of that was ever true, okay? Paul's not that stupid uh, to bring Titus into the temple, being a Greek. But they said those things, and, you know, that's just enough to get the crowd worked up. And they converge on Paul, and they're beating him. I mean, they're just literally just beating him. And, you know, God and his divine wisdom he's got these Romans on standby because right there near the temple not too far away you have a place where, where the, the Roman guard was I'm trying to think of the name and it escapes me but it's right there very close to the temple and they mobilize and come down and, and, and rescue Paul okay and that's how this whole thing begins the accusations the going before uh, the different folks you know that, that you're reading through in the book of Acts and so we're going to start where, okay, from Jerusalem, they, they take him up to Caesarea. And the reason they have to take him up to Caesarea is because there is a plot against Paul's life. And they realize, uh, uh, in fact, it's Paul's nephew, a, a young boy, that, that overhears this plot. And he tells the captain of the guard and... and uh, Anyway, so they prepare Paul, and they, they, they march him to, uh, to Caesarea, where they have a little bit more, they have a lot more troops there, a lot more of the Roman, Roman troops or Roman legion, and um, better protection. So they move him up there, and this is where Paul's going to spend about two years. Now, in, um, look at Acts, I want to make sure I get this right, because that doesn't look right, but I hope it is. That ain't right. Maybe it's 23. Let me check it. 31. Okay, yeah. Look at uh, Acts 23. So this is when he's in route, when they're taking him to Caesarea. It says, Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, verse 31, uh, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris, that's probably uh, Antipapri, Antipra, I had it right, Antipatris, Antipatris. I like Antipatris myself, but anyway. Um, they stopped there. This is a smaller city before reaching Caesarea. Both Caesarea and this place were built by Herod the Great. Herod the Great had all these works going on and, and, um, he built this place, and it's named after it's aimed after his father, Antipater, or Antipater. You know, it's 
not Antiochus, it's an Antiochus or whatever. I just, Antiochus, yeah, Antiochus, yeah. Anyway, so they, they hold him up there, and then the next day they bring him to, to, uh, to Caesarea. It says, on the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him and returned into the castle. Um, uh, let's see, is it Herod's Judgment Hall? Yeah. Yeah, he was commanded to be kept, verse 35, in Herod's judgment hall. So that's where they've got Paul. Um, Caesarea just said he was built by Herod the Great, and I believe that's in honor of um, Gaius Julius Caesar Augustus uh, or Octavian, who was the founder of the Roman Empire, and he built Caesarea. You get the word Caesar in there. Um, of course, now Paul was just there not too long ago when, before he went to Jerusalem. Now he's back, and he's going to be there a while. Caesarea was a modern city for the times. It, it was complete with underground sewers. It had a palace, public buildings, theater, amphitheater, and something else that made it special. It had an artificial harbor that uh, Rome had uh, constructed. I guess they just bring the debris. I don't know how they would build a harbor in that day, but they were able to do it. Maybe building wooden barges or something and going out and dropping off. You got to drop the material to create the to create the harbor. But they had this. I guess it was a magnificent artificial harbor that they had uh, built. This was. I said this was home to Philip the Evangelist. Which remember, God put these people in in specific locations because of the uh, the contact they would have. He's in a he's in one of the mo a major port. A major point, and what is he? He's an evangelist. So what is he going to do? He's going to run into strangers from all over the known world that are coming into that port, and uh, so it makes sense. Um, this is where also where uh, the centurion Cornelius was stationed by Rome. Um, Acts chapter ten verse one. Jesus walked this area with his disciples in Matthew sixteen thirteen. And this is Paul's third visit. I say that in quotations. He, he, he's not really a visitor at this point. He's a prisoner. But this is his third time there in Caesarea. Um, so after two years, Paul leaves. And by the way, it's going to take two weeks to cover all this. So like there's 17 different places that he mentions along the way. And I, I at least want to give a comment a little bit about each place, even the ones they sailed by. So it's going to take a couple. It's going to take two weeks to cover this. Um, after two years, Paul leaves for Rome. They sail up the coast and stop at the Phoenician city of Zidon, right there. Okay. Now Tyre and Zidon, they got they kind of go together. They're companion cities. Uh, there is much in the scriptures about this place, Zidon. In the Old Testament, it was, it's spelled with a Z, Zidon with a Z. In the New Testament, it's with an S. Um, you have the uh, Zidonians mentioned in the Old Testament, enemies of Israel. The place was extremely pagan. Uh, it's, it's the border area where um, Lebanon begins and Israel ends. I, I think it's before that now, but in that day. The reason I say that, there was one city that was parallel to it, and that was Dan. And Dan was parallel with Tyre and Zidon, right there in that general area. They were just over to the, Dan was just over to the left here. Let's see, you got Tyre and Zidon. They were somewhere over here in this area. The far, uh, they were the farthest east. They may have bordered, I don't know if they bordered Galilee, if it went up that far or not. But anyway, um, so you're getting to the edge of Israel's uh, Land grant, or where where they or where they where they actually had some rule. So when you get up to Zion, you're in Gentile territory. Tyre and Zion is Gentile, very pagan. They worshipped uh, uh, Baal and Ashtaroth. Um, let's see. In Mark 15, verse 21 to 22, Jesus Christ is up in Tyre and Zion. He went that far. Um, Tyre and well, let me, give you, let me give you this. I jumped ahead of myself here. Let's see. Tyre and Zidon, the Zidonians, worship Astroth, were partly responsible for the apostasy of the tribe of Dan, the city of Dan located near Zidon. 
That's in Judges chapter 10, verse 6. I'm getting ahead of my notes here, and that's not a good thing for me. Um, Judges 10, verse 6. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon, the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord and served not him. Uh, when you're reading the book of Judges, you find, you, you find these Danites. Dan was not really given that area, but these Danites, they were kind of, they were, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they were east of Jerusalem. Dan's area was over was, uh, in more south. But they're way up here in the north. And they start this city. It's the city of Dan. Now, don't get confused. It's not, not the entire tribe there, but there's a bunch of Danites that are staying there. And you find this apostasy that takes place in the book of Judges reminds you of the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, what you have are the seeds of the apostasy of a future religion coming out of that. Because they, they, these Danites come down, and there's already this fellow that's, I mean, he's about as pagan as you can get. He's got a Levite to his priest, who's a younger man he calls father. He has, um, he has all kinds of images that he's worshiping, okay? And these Danites come down, they say, hey, you got a Levite to your priest, do you? They stole him. Well, actually, he wanted to go. He said, I could be a priest to one man or a tribe. I'd rather be a priest to a tribe. So they take him home. Well, they go up to Dan, okay? And while they're there in Dan, guess who their neighbors are? Tyre and Zidon. And next thing you know, you've got this female deity and this male deity and, well, just study Roman Catholicism, man. It, 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 it's all laid out. And it... It begins in the Old Testament, not the New. It begins in the Old Testament. And the, the town that they uh, renamed Dan was called Laish. So if you study Laish in the Old Testament, you'll get, a, you'll get, a, get an idea. Um, some other things. Solomon would be beguiled by the women of Zidon. In uh, 1 Kings 11.5, it says, For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, uh, the goddess of the Zidonians and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. So he was affected by that. You know, he married all these women from everywhere, and, and you know, they're all yapping at him about their God and everything, and the wisest man that ever lived, you know, he caved. <laughs> yeah. Smart enough to know he only needed one wife, right? You thought after 10 or 20 he'd have stopped, but, you know, he's got to have a 1,000. <laughs> anyway... Huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, after a while, all you do is spend all your time pleasing, uh, pleasing a bunch of women, you know, and uh, every one of them's got a different idea of what they want. And they, they want cities made after them. I mean, it, it just never ended probably with him. Um, you, you find Solomon very depressed. I mean, I think Ecclesiastes was the last book he wrote. Man, when you read it, man, it's like, whew. you talk about the air going out of his balloon. Uh the other thing about Zidon is Jezebel's from there. In fact, Jezebel's father was king of the Zidonians. So now you've got Ahab married to a woman whose king is king of the Zidonians who worship Baal and Ashtoreth. And then you, I mean, Ahab is one of the worst kings that Israel ever had. Now, we'll say this. Ahab does get right with God. But no thanks to his wife, let's put it that way. That's in 1 Kings 16, 31. Then you have the widow of Zarephath that fed Elijah. She's from a suburb, because it says it's of Zidon. Okay? Uh, Zarephath. That's in 1 Kings 17, 9. And, and I'm just touching the surface, man. I mean, Tyre and Zidon are, are, there's a lot in the Old Testament about that. So from, from Tyre and Zidon, they go to a place called um, Myra. That's when they're, they're, because they sail from Caesarea to, to, to Zidon. Then they sail and they come around Cyprus and they land. This is the last place they're going to touch as far as um, um, Asia Minor. And that's the place called Myra. And they're hugging the coastline for a reason. I mean, it's always safest to, to you know, they could have sailed, they could have sailed through open water, you know. <laughs> You'd think that they may, but that's not always the safest. Um, 
especially in that day when you know they were they were sailing by the stars uh, and not GPS and they didn't have any motors or anything to overcome situations uh, so it's always safe to stay as, as within not I wouldn't say within eye shot of uh, or within eye view of land was probably always the safest thing not that they could always do that but they tried um, so Myra is is the last port that they're going to stop at and look in uh, 27 and I need to get over there and make a mark here let's see if I put this over there I'll keep coming back to chapter 27 uh, look at verse 5 and 6 it said, and when we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we covered those areas, he came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the, a centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. So while they're there, uh, they just happen. And evidently, the, the, these Roman soldiers, centurions, or whatever they happen to be that are able, that are taking Paul to Rome, they can commandeer these ships. I mean, they've got some authority uh, they, may, they, may, they are ships carrying uh, product, of course, produce and things like that. I think this is carrying like wheat or something like that. Um, but they can just commandeer and say, look, we've we're, we're, we got these passengers that need to go to Rome. They're, they're prisoners. And so they put them on board. Uh, one of the things you see here is notice that the ship of Alexandria is headed to Rome. Your Bible has a way of letting you know you know that uh, there's two sets of manuscripts of the Antiochian manuscripts or the Byzantine manuscripts that your King James Bible came from. And then there's all the corrupt versions out there that came from Alexandria, Egypt. What's Egypt the type of in the Bible? Type of the world. Who's the world connected with? Rome. Because they're going to Italy. Your Bible makes that connection for you. Uh, if you look up the, uh, the, the manuscript Vaticanus, it is an Alexandrian text type. And that's where all the new Bibles came from. They found Vaticanus in the basement of the Vatican. You see how to get there. Probably a ship from Alexandria. That's what I'm guessing. Might have been on this one. Well, I don't know. This one didn't make it. <laughs> it's on the next one. I mean, you know, Alexandria burned. The whole city burned. I mean, and, and all the books and everything that was there. But some of it got out because they've got this Alexandrian manuscript in their basement. And it's as corrupt as it could be. But your Bible gives you hints and tells you. They were first called Christians at... Where does our Bible come from? The Byzantine or Antiochian manuscripts. Stick with the book. All right, then he mentions uh, a place called Nidus... And I believe it's right here. Okay? And Nidus was, <laughs> I think they intended to go to Nidus. They didn't make it. They ended up going a, a, a little bit different route. Um, Nidus is a peninsula that stuck out 90 miles into the sea. And it separated the Aegean Sea from the Mediterranean, kind of like where there was the kind of the official break. And maybe they wanted to pull in there, but they, they wind up at Crete. Um, Crete is, well, right here, big island. Uh, it's an island in, in the Aegean Sea. I, I thought Aegean? I don't know. It's, it, if it is, it's, it's on the very edge of the Aegean. I mean, the Aegean Sea is up there. You know, this is what I understand that the Aegean Sea, I would think that this area would, but anyway, there. What I read said a G and C, Mediterranean Sea Major, that's the where it's at. But Crete became a bridge between Greece and Asia Minor. It's 156 miles long. It's 7 to 30 miles wide, depending on where you're at on the island. And the Cretans were descended from the Kaftor or the Kaftorum. You'll find those in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy, different places. I'm not going to run it. I'll give you one verse. Uh, Amos chapter 9 verse 7 Amos chapter 9 verse 7 
It says, Are ye not as children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel, saith the Lord? Have not I brought up Israel out of the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Syrians from Kerr? You see, these, uh, these Christians are closely related to, your, uh, to the Philistines. They're, they're of hematic origin. And this is, you have one of the most bigoted, blanketed, racist comments in the entire Bible. While under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I might add. Oh, that's right. It wasn't Paul that said it. It was one of their own that said it. You know the verse I'm referring to? In Titus chapter 1, verse 12, it says, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. What that boils down to, they're liars, they're wicked, and they're lazy. Slow belly, somebody lazy. <laughs> Now, your Bible does that. You say, well, just a blanket statement about a people? Yep, blanket statement. Well, actually, Paul didn't say it. S who said it? A Cretan wrote it down. It was a prophet of their own. Who? <laughs> Every, even, even, even false prophets get it right once in a while. It's like a stop clock, you know. It's right twice a day. I, I have a feeling that this affected their journey when they pulled into Crete. Uh, I, I, don't think, I don't think because Paul talked about it's too late. I think they were spending too much time there. And I think the reason they're spending too much time there is because these slow bellies aren't getting the work done to the ship. That's just my thought. Anyway, there are four places that are mentioned uh, that are in Crete. There's Salmon on the east side, right uh, here. Salmon on the east tip there. Fair Havens with the, the city of Lycia, which is going to be right in this area. It's right there in the middle of Crete. And then Phoenice, I don't know, Phoenice, I don't know how you pronounce it, right here on, the, on this, in this area. I think it's, the dot is right there. They want to get to the southwest part of the island because evidently the port or the harbor or whatever was big enough for them to winter in because it's too late, or at least they believe it's too late for them to sail. Well, they make it to the Fair Havens, right here in the center, and it's, too, it, it's, it's not the place they need to be. They can't winter there. Uh, look at verse uh, 27, verse 8 to 13. Let me turn over there. Um, it says, And hardly passing it, came into a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous, and much time was spent, <laughs> they didn't. it says, Because the fast was now already passed. He's talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, September, October. The fast that's involved there is done. This is late in the season to be traveling this part of the country, or this part of the seas, and it says, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lady and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, <laughs> never listen to the preacher. Nevertheless, a centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which are spoken by Paul. And because the haven was not commodious to winter in, uh, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Phoenice and there to winter. Doesn't look like they're going very far. It looks like they're just, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's some, some miles, but it looks like it's just a jaunt. They were going to make it. It says, uh, where, is, where is the haven of Crete and lie toward the southwest and the northwest? And when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete. They're staying right <laughs> as close as they can get without, you know, bottoming out the ship. But you know how that goes. You ever, you ever, you ever go on a vacation, you know, and always something? <laughs> Rich, you know that. Always something. I mean... There's going to be something that goes wrong or something that goes haywire. Well, you know, they loose, and here's what happens. Verse 14. But not long after, there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurocladon. <laughs> Man, that, that name scares me, much less the storm, you know. And when the ship was caught, 
In other words, they're trying to they're trying to stay right next to the coastline. They're, all they're wanting to do is move down a little bit and park the thing. But they got caught in this. They got caught in this gale, and it, they, they said they could not bear up uh, into the wind, and so we let her drive. This is where the first woman gets her driver's license. <laughs> So we let her, okay, that wasn't funny, was it? All right. Verse 16. Now I got to see where I'm at here. I don't want to miss anything. Um, okay. Yep. And running under a certain island, uh, certain island which is called Clauda, we had mu much work to come by the boat. Now this is where uh, you can see Clauda. It, it's an island. I, I, I think it's kind of covered up there, but, or that dot is the island. And it's just providing them enough cover to where they're able to anchor for a very short period of time. And what they're trying to do is th they realize they're in real trouble. They're going into a major storm, maybe a hurricane. And what they want to do is they want to take ropes. And how this works is you just look at which way the waves are coming, and you throw the ropes down that side, and it washes them under the ship. You grab them on the other side, and you, you tie these huge ropes all the way up and down that ship, and that, it's called undergirding. They're girding the ship against the waves to strengthen that ship. Um, I imagine that this, this did take some time, but here's something else. Look what he says here. Um, verse 17, And when they had taken up, they used helps at undergirding the ship, fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand, strike sail, and so we're driven. Now, I thought, what in the world's quicksand is doing out in the sea? But he, he's, he's talking about sandbars, which is quicksand. You know what, what can happen? If you have a storm coming in and you've got a ship that's close to shore, if there are sands that move around underneath it, they can literally create a sandbar right next to your ship or even underneath it to where you get, what, stuck I guess sandbar, I didn't know sandbars moved, but they can move. That sand can be redeposited. Why? Because those waves and, that, and what's happening is, is washing. And they were fearful that they were going to get stuck because this sand would just kind of literally create a pocket and they would be stuck there. And then the storm would beat them to death. So they should have struck sail. It's like, this is the only thing we can do. We can't get back to Crete. So he said, we got to get out of here. We got to get to the open sea. So that's what they do. Um, and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, and the next day they lighten the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. I imagine this was, it, you know, at, at this point I think Paul has withdrawn himself. We see there that he's been verse 21, but after a long absence. <laughs> you see, what's Paul doing? He's praying, man. He's down in the hold. He's praying. He's asking God, well, you know, didn't you say I was going to make it to Rome? <laughs> I mean, he's kind of wondering himself, you know. And I can't think of anything more miserable than being on a ship being tossed. I, I guess it doesn't matter if you've got sea legs or not. When you start going through something like that, you're, you're going to throw up, and you're going to be sick all the time. In fact, we find out they didn't, like, I don't think they ate for 14 days. Because you can't. And so, now, Dr. Ruckman has this drawing where they did this, and it probably was something like that. I think it was a 500, a 500 mile journey, something like that. I've got it written down here somewhere. Okay, add a thousand onto that with all the zigzagging they had to do to, to, to stay into the wind, and, and I mean, who, who knows? But they're out there for days and days and days. And it comes to a point where you just lose all hope. I mean, they lighten the ship. They start throwing out everything they can. They got all their product. I mean, you know, everything but the prisoners. And they didn't throw them over yet. But they probably wanted to rather than throw out their product. Um, so let's see here. Claude. Okay. Oh, I did, I did see something verse 16. It says, And running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, 
We had mu much work to come by the boat. I thought somebody told me, you know, you can call a ship a boat. Well, this ship's called a boat. I guess anything that floats, carries people and stuff, would be considered a boat. But I, I thought somebody told me that. It's like, you know, don't call, you know, don't tell a Marine he's in the Navy kind of thing, you know. I don't know. Has anybody ever heard that? It's not, it's not a, it's not, okay, you've heard that? Okay, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a boat, it's a ship. Huh? Yeah. Anyway, I just thought I'd heard that. So, huh? Yeah, they both float. <laughs> Most of the time. So anyway, after a long period of time, they wind up at this little island called Melita. And they just kind of, I mean, that was just the Lord's grace that they, uh, they ran in, into that. This is modern-day Malta. Modern-day Malta. Um, I'll call it Melita since the Bible does. Melita, like I said, is 582 miles. They said 530. 582 miles as the crow flies from Crete. Um, The one they cut away? Okay, that's possible. Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a, that's a possibility. Okay. Well, then, I get, don't, don't call a ship a boat, okay? We've learned something today. Yeah, well, that's exactly my case. Is it in the sea? It's a fish, man. Well, does it swim? It, not, not that it's in the sea. But if it swims in the sea, the Bible says it's a fish. Now, just because, you know, somebody later on said, well, it's a mammal. But is it in the sea? And does it swim? Okay. Yeah, anyway. Folks get to. Anyway. Uh, Melita is the largest island in a chain and it's uh, 56 miles off the southern coast of Sicily and 174 miles off the coast of Italy. So they're close, okay, but they're kind of stuck on this island, uh, and, and, and this is where it, it, it goes terribly wrong, but yet God saves the whole bunch. Now, this island is 17.5 miles long, 9.25 miles wide, okay? So it's only... Tw it's, um, 22, 122 square miles. I figured that up. That's Dayton times two. About twice the size of Dayton. Uh, the capital city there is Valletta. Now, when you read this, you say there are, it talks about them being a barbarous pe people. Okay. They weren't, you know, in uh, loincloths and going around going, ooh, ooh, you know, and build a fire for them, you know, like they're cavemen. They're not savages. When the Bible talks about barbarous people, it's somebody's culture and language that nobody knows. The Bible, look at um, 1 Corinthians 14, 11. First Corinthians 14, 11. It says, therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, that's the language, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. This is somebody foreign. It's not that there's, uh, it's not that they're, you know, uh, savages or, or cavemen living on Malta. Um, they're on this island three whole months, and I guess these people treated them very, very well. In fact, Paul begins a mission project there. Uh, he said that no small kindness they, that they, they did to him. Now, 276 souls were on board that ship, and not one of them lost their life. That's Acts 27, 37. 276 souls. Um, what's interesting here is notice you have a people where nobody knows the language. Now, I do believe that the head, the guy named Publius, 
who is the kind of the chief of, of that area, that island, uh, he may very well, I'm sure he knew, he, he probably knew Italian or something because they're, they're able to communicate with him somewhat, but probably the people that, that saved their lives or helped them off the beach or wherever they landed, I'm sure that uh, they may not have known a word of Greek or a word of Hebrew, I don't know. Anyway, you would think the Roman guards would have understood them, but what I found out is that Malta, they have their own language called Maltese. They've got their own indigenous language, so probably no one on that boat understood, and probably only the highest officials that were in uh, Melita would have understood what Paul and, and the, the folks on that ship had to say. Um, today, Malta is 98% Roman Catholic. 98%. They do have freedom of religion written in their state constitution. The population is what blew me away. Population of Malta, as of 2022, is over 500,000 people. 500,000. See, what did, I think Dayton had, uh, Dayton's population is 186,000. So, I mean, even though it's twice the size, I mean, it's like three times the population. I mean, there's a lot of folks there. It's growing. Um, the, uh, how many of you ever heard of the Maltese Falcon? Anybody ever seen the movie? Black and White, Humphrey Bogart? You might want to watch it. Um, the, the Maltese were subject to a monarchy that existed in Sicily, right next door to them. And they had to pay tribute every year to this monarchy, these kings. And the one year they came up with the Maltese falcon, it was a falcon that was studded with jewels. And that was the thing that they were delivering. Now, in the movie, I think they've got the, um, um, what's that group? Um, the ones that have all the the Roman Catholic special group that has all the not Knights of Columbus but close huh not the Jesuits but they're um, Knights Templar thank you in the, I guess in the movie, the Knights Templar are the ones that give this falcon, and, and somehow it winds up lost or stolen, and they're forever looking, you know, probably still looking for it. I don't know. I'm, I can't, if I saw the movie, I don't remember. Um, anything black and white, I tried to stay away from growing up. I don't know why. I just figured, you know, it's so old. Why do I want to watch that? Now I'm really old, and now I want to go back and watch it. Um, but it was tribute paid to Sicily. Uh, that film was around 1940, 1941, somewhere in the 40s. So the, when they did this was like 1530. 1530 A.D. is when they, this Maltese Falcon thing they were giving to the, uh, the monarchy there. Just a little bit of trivia. But the, all these places have a lot of history to them. I mean, they're, they're given over to this kingdom and that kingdom and this conqueror and that conqueror. It about make, it, you know, people that can study history and keep all that in their mind, God bless them. Me, I'm going to forget this stuff by the end of the day. Um, I can't keep it all in my mind. But it is helping me to understand that, you know, these places have, they have, uh, they're still in this world. They still exist. Now, some of these places, I think like Tyre and Zidon, I think it's nothing but like a fishing village now. It's been totally dismantled, annihilated, I think. I don't think there's much left there. But in some of these places, they're still thriving, you know, and you realize, well, Paul was there. You know, he actually landed on this shore somewhere, or at least swam to shore somewhere. Because, <laughs> you know, the Lord just, I mean, they, they, they found a creek. Now, they, they say that they found the bay where Paul or that ship got pulled into. And it, it's left it sticking out there and where the, it, it literally broke that ship in two, the waves and the sea. And uh, God said, I'm going to give you every one of them that sail with you. Boy, that was really, that was really gracious of God. He didn't let any of them die. Could have. He said, I'm going to give them all to you, Paul. 
And Paul said, every one of you is going to make it. Every one of you is going to live. And they did. And then these folks took care of them for three months. And then they sail on. Now, we'll pick it up next week and go from, from Melita. And really, I think except for one little place, yeah, Syri well, Syracuse, then we get to the mainland, and then we'll, we'll this is Syracuse, New York. Um, we steal names from everybody. I don't think we got a, a, I don't think we got an original name anywhere except for, you know, uh, Mud Holler or someplace, you know. That, um, but, huh? Knock them stiff. I like that. Well, that's original. I stand corrected. All right, anybody got a question or a comment? Yeah. Oh, a G in, is it? Okay. Okay. It just seemed like awful far out there to be considered part of the Aegean, but I guess it could be. So they would have wanted to get away. To, they had to sail away to get to deeper water because if you stay in shallow water, the storm is twice as bad on you. If you've ever, uh, I remember one time we were on uh, Cowan Lake and a storm blew up, and I mean in seconds, man. We had little three-foot waves uh, hitting a little John boat, man. And, and, I mean, just that ride back in was horrifying. I thought it was my... Uh, my dad and my brother, who had cancer at the time, and myself, and I thought we was all three going to drown. When we got close enough to shore, we jumped out of the boat. We, we, we pulled the boats up so far, and then I think it was my brother, man. He just picked up that engine or that motor right off that boat, carried it on the shore, and then I pulled up the John boat. I, it, but I'm telling you, just weather just comes. If you're in shallow water, those waves are, are going to be ten times worse than being in deeper water. I found one Baptist church, a couple Pentecostal churches.